Hi everyone, and welcome to this video that accompanies section 23.6 of the book Algorithms Illuminated Part 4. This is the last section from the optional chapter 23, and it's a section about NP-completeness. NP-completeness is basically a specific form of NP-hardness. So, for example, the three-set problem, as we know, that's an NP-hard problem. What does that mean? That means if I gave you a polynomial time algorithm that solved the three-set problem, you could using reductions, automatically build polynomial time algorithms for all of the problems in the complexity class NP, for all problems with efficiently recognizable solutions. But in fact, we can say something uh, more precise about 3SAT and most of the other NP-hard problems that we've seen, which is that it turns out it's actually NP-complete. And what that's going to mean is that actually, it's not just that an efficient subroutine for 3SAT is sufficient to solve every problem in NP, it's that actually every problem in NP is literally just a thinly disguised special case of the 3SAT problem. In other words, NP-complete problems like the 3SAT problem, they are universal in the sense that they simultaneously encode every single problem in the complexity class NP. Sound pretty amazing? Well, it is. Now let's learn about it. What do we mean when we say that uh, one problem A is a thinly disguised version of another problem B? Well, we can make that idea mathematical uh, through the use of Levin reductions. So a Levin reduction is a special case of a Cook reduction, Cook reductions being the reductions we've been using throughout this entire video playlist. So a Levin reduction is a special restricted type of Cook reduction where intuitively it's only allowed to do the minimum imaginable amount of work. All it can do is invoke a subroutine for the problem B once, and the only other thing it can do is pre-process its input to feed it into B and pre-process B's output to return that as its final solution. So let's redraw our usual cartoon to reflect these new restrictions imposed by a Levin reduction. First, I should say at the outset, Levin reductions only even make sense when you're talking about a pair of search problems. So think about we're reducing some search problem A to some other search problem B, like the three sat problem and the search version of the TSP. As usual, we'll be imagining that we're given an efficient subroutine solving the problem B, the problem that we're trying to prove is hard. That's the magenta box. And then the responsibility of the reduction is to build the light blue box to show how to use that magenta box uh, in the service of actually solving problem A as well, the known hard problem. Now, unlike a Cook reduction, which is allowed to invoke its magenta box any polynomial number of times and is also allowed to use the results of those polynomial many subroutine calls however it wants, uh, the Levin reduction is, has its hands tied much more tightly. So first of all, it's only allowed to invoke the magenta box once. So the beginning of the reduction, pretty much the only thing it can do is take its input to the problem A it's tasked with solving and then pre-process it, transform it into some input of the problem B that it can then feed into the magenta box. Moreover, a Levin reduction is required to use the output of the magenta box in a very specific way. Now remember, we're dealing with search problems, so the magenta box will either say, here's a feasible solution to the instance of problem B that you gave me, or the magenta box will say, there was no solution to the instance of problem B that you gave me. And the blue box in a Levin reduction is then required to just copy the answer. So if the magenta box comes back and says there was no solution, then the light blue box is forced to say, my opinion, in my opinion, there's no feasible solution to the instance of A that I started with. On the other hand, if the magenta box returns a feasible solution to the instance of B it was given, then with polynomial amount of post-processing, the Levin reduction has to at that point transform it into a feasible solution of the instance of A that it was given. So we've been seeing a whole lot of reductions throughout this video playlist. So the question you should now be asking is, well, were we really using the full power of Cook reductions or were we inadvertently just kind of using Levin reductions anyways? The answer is technically we weren't always doing Levin reductions, but kind of morally we really were. What do I mean? Well, 
11 reduction is only defined for a pair of search problems. And if you go back through the reductions, we've seen many of them involved optimization problems. However, if you go back to those reductions, like say the NP hardness of the traveling salesman problem, and instead of looking at the optimization version of the traveling salesman problem, you look at the uh, search version of the, of the traveling salesman problem, where you're also given a target tour cost capital T, then all of a sudden that reduction does become 11 reduction. One reduction we had that was between two pairs of search problems where I think this format is super clear uh, was the second of the four big ones that we did in chapter 22. So that was a reduction from the three sat problem to the directed Hamiltonian path problem. And if you go back and look at that, or maybe you sort of remember at least vaguely, we were given the three sat instance. All we did was construct a big, somewhat complicated directed graph, but whatever, we constructed a directed graph. We just fed it into our directed Hamiltonian subroutine. If it said there's no Hamiltonian path, we reported that there's no satisfiable assignment. If it gave us a Hamiltonian path, we extracted from it a satisfying assignment. So that is an absolutely canonical example of 11 reduction. But again, if you go back to the reductions throughout this video playlist, and I encourage you to do this, and you think about the search version of all of the optimization problems that we discussed, all of the reductions that we've been looking at really are 11 reductions. You now know all about Cook reductions and uh, the special case of Levin reductions. Uh, there's a third type of reduction that I'll mention briefly just because you're likely to see it in pretty much any book on complexity theory and also plenty of books on algorithms, uh, which is something known, sometimes it's called a CARP reduction, that's what I'm going to call it, um, or you may see it called a many-to-one reduction or mapping reduction. So what's a CARP reduction? CARP reduction is basically just a Levin reduction except for decision problems instead of for search problems. So remember, in a decision problem, all an algorithm has to do is report yes or no. If there's a feasible solution, the algorithm is actually not responsible for handing one to you on a silver platter. And so this cartoon on this slide becomes even simpler if you have decision problems. So the magenta box, the subroutine for B, is just going to say yes or no. It's not going to give you a solution in the yes case. And then the light blue box is just going to parrot that answer. The magenta box said no, the blue box will say no. If the magenta box says yes, the blue box will say yes. Again, the blue box for a decision problem is not responsible for actually constructing that feasible solution. So for any book that talks primarily about decision problems, as opposed to the search problems that we've been talking about here, any book that talks just about decision problems, you're going to be seeing CARP reductions uh, instead of Levin reductions. Again, I'm doing this entire video playlist in terms of search problems, because those are much more natural from an algorithmic viewpoint. We are now ready to formally define NP-complete problems, problems that are the hardest problems within NP, problems that simultaneously encode as special cases all other problems that have efficiently recognizable solutions. NP-completeness is really best thought of as a specific kind of NP-hardness, so let me just remind you about that formal definition of NP-hard problems that we finally got to three videos ago. Our formal definition of an NP-hard problem is a problem B for which, for every NP problem, every problem, every search problem with efficiently recognizable solutions, for every such problem A, there's a reduction from A to B. And again, the entire video playlist, we've been looking at Cook reductions. So a problem is NP-hard if, given a polynomial time subroutine solving B, uh, you would automatically get polynomial time algorithms for all of the problems in the class NP. To qualify as NP-complete, that problem B has to satisfy some additional properties. So first of all, as we'll see, only search problems are going to be eligible to be NP-complete. So while the TSP in its optimization version, that's an NP-hard problem, the TSP in its optimization version is not going to be an NP-complete problem. It is true that the search version of the TSP will in fact be an NP-complete problem. Okay, so NP-complete only refers to search problems. Next, it should be the case that not only is B algorithmically sufficient to solve all the problems in NP, actually all the problems in NP are literally just thinly disguised versions of B. And remember, we've expressed thinly disguised versions through 11 reduction. So for NP hardness, we just wanted a cook reduction from every NP problem to B. For NP completeness, we're going to insist on 11 reduction from every NP problem to B. This first condition is basically requiring that the problem B is simultaneously encoding all problems of NP, all problems that have efficiently recognizable solutions. The second condition is so that we can interpret an NP-complete problem as the hardest problems among NP. 
And so for that to make sense, we're going to require that B is in fact a member of NP, that B in fact is a search problem with efficiently recognizable solutions. So this definition of an NP-complete problem, that's you know, one of the absolute most important definitions in the entire history of the field of computer science. Uh, so I want to make sure that it's clear that you will, if you look in some books, see a slightly different definition of NP-completeness. And I don't want you to get confused. So again, what we're working with here is search problems, where an algorithm is responsible for handing back a feasible solution when one exists, and Leaven reductions, where you pre-process an input, feed it to the subroutine, and post-process its output to get a feasible solution when one exists. In many books, instead, they will use decision problems rather than search problems. And a decision problem is a yes-no problem, so you don't have to construct a feasible solution. You just report whether one exists. And then if you're using decision problems, uh, the analog of 11 reduction is one of these CARP or many to one reductions, where you don't even need to bother with the post-processing step. You just ask the magenta box, yes or no, and then you just parrot that exact same answer as your own. So I say all this just to ward off any confusion, should you go read about NP-completeness uh, from another source. And actually, at this point, you might be kind of irritated, right? Because we have these three different types of problems, you know, decision and search and optimization. We have these three different types of reductions, you know, Cook and Levin and Carp. And it seems like you can mix and match, and it's not really clear, you know, which pair you should use. But, you know, unless you're going into complexity theory full time, if you're focused mostly on the algorithmic side, don't worry about the fact that there's multiple kinds of problems, that there's multiple kinds of reductions. As far as the algorithmic implications, as far as you know, the guidance the theory gives you about how to tackle different problems, it's exactly the same no matter which of these definitions that you use. How cool is the definition of an NP-complete problem? A single problem with efficiently recognizable solutions that simultaneously encodes every such problem. It's kind of amazing that an NP-complete problem could really exist. Wait a minute. I actually haven't shown you an example of an NP-complete problem yet. So do they really exist? There are such universal problems. And in fact, the theorem that we've touched on a couple times uh, already shows that. The Cook-Levin theorem. When I first uh, showed you this theorem, I kind of shortchanged it. Uh, I said that it proved that the three sat problem is NP hard. It actually proves something stronger. It proves that the three sat problem is in fact NP complete. And the reason this is true, the reason the Cook-Levin theorem actually says something stronger, it's actually kind of evident if you go back and review the proof sketch of the Cook-Levin theorem that I gave to you a few videos ago. So back then, you know, what we, we, the proof was a reduction. It was a reduction from an abstract NP problem, which we were calling A, a reduction from that problem A to the three sat problem. And at the time, we were only worried about uh, having using a Cook reduction, because those were the only reductions we knew about up to that point. But if you go back and look at the sketch of that reduction, it is a canonical example of 11 reduction. To remind you how that reduction worked, uh, so you fabricate this three set instance. It has two sets of decision variables. One set of decision variables encodes candidate solutions to the instance of the problem A that you were given. And then there's this sort of two-dimensional two table of state variables that are encoding the uh, computation performed by the verification algorithm associated with that uh, abstract NP problem, capital A. And we also had a bunch of constraints to enforce the intended semantics across the uh, state variables. Point being, all the reduction did is take the given instance of the problem A, construct this big uh, three-set instance, and construct it in a way that there's a correspondence between satisfying assignments to that three-set instance and feasible solutions to the instance of the problem A that the reduction started with. And so then, you know, what did it do? It literally just invoked its assumed subroutine for solving three sat once on the three sat instance it, uh, it concocted. And uh, if the three sat subroutine said there's no satisfying truth assignment, the reduction concluded that there was no feasible solution to the instance of problem A it was given. On the other hand, if the subroutine for three sat came back with a satisfying assignment, you could read off a feasible solution to the instance of A we were given just from the values of the solution variables. And that's exactly what 11 reduction does. Preprocess, i.e. transform um, an instance of this problem to a three-set instance, 
invoke the assumed subroutine once, that's what we did, and then just basically copy the results. And for the case where there is a feasible solution, do some post-processing to translate it to a solution of the problem that you started with. That's the stronger version of the Cook-Levin theorem and a sketch of why it's true. Uh, so that's, you know, that's not an easy observation. There's a reason that uh, major prizes were awarded to Cook and Levin uh, for this work. Uh, but now again, the good news is that once we have one NP-complete problem, we get to stand on the shoulders of these giants and use reductions to generate further NP-complete problems. So we already used reductions to spread NP-hardness, and there we were working with Cook reductions. Because NP-completeness is all about Levin reductions, we're going to use Levin reductions to spread NP-completeness from one problem to another. So what this means for us is that we have a very simple three-step recipe for proving that a problem is NP-complete, very much in the spirit of our two-step recipe for proving that problems were NP-hard. So remember in that two-step recipe, how did it work? You choose a known NP-hard problem A, and then you reduce it to the target problem B using a Cook reduction. So to spread NP-completeness, we're going to need to make a couple changes, but not much. So first of all, why do we need a third step? Well, it's because, you know, NP-completeness, remember, that means not only are the reductions from all the problems in NP to you, but you better yourself be a member of the class NP. You're supposed to be one of the hardest problems in NP if you're an NP-complete problem. So the extra step is just checking that the problem B that you're trying to prove NP-complete really does belong to NP, because that's a prerequisite. Otherwise, it's the same. You choose a known NP-complete problem A, and then you reduce it to the problem that you're interested in B. And if you want to spread not just NP-hardness, but NP-completeness, then it's important that you use a Levin reduction rather than a more general Cook reduction. But that is it. Prove that your problem is in NP. Uh, choose your favorite NP-complete problem. You can start with 3SAT. Uh, and then reduce uh, that problem using a Levin reduction to your target problem. If you can do those three things, boom, your problem B is in fact NP-complete. Now this simple three-step recipe has been applied many times over, and as a result, we now know that thousands of natural problems are NP-complete, including problems from all across engineering, the life sciences, and the social sciences. For example, uh, the search versions of almost all of the optimization problems we've discussed, you know, including the TSP, the knapsack, you know, maximum coverage, minimum mix span, the search versions of all of those optimization problems uh, are in fact not just NP-hard, but NP-complete. If all of the NP-complete problems from chapter 22 aren't enough, well then you can check out that classic book I mentioned earlier by Gary and Johnson uh, for hundreds of more examples of NP-complete problems. That concludes these videos that accompany the optional chapter 23 on P, NP, and all that. Uh, thanks very much for checking them out. Uh, I hope you now, having watched them, feel much more solid mathematically you know, on exactly what does it mean for a problem to be NP-hard. What's the rigorous definition? You know, what's the formal definition of the P versus NP conjecture? You know, what is, what's the difference between a problem being NP-hard or NP-complete? What are these fancier conjectures like the exponential time hypothesis? And so on. These videos were directed at those of you who were motivated to up your uh, level of expertise with NP-hard problems up to the highest level that we mentioned, level four. So at this level, you can actually have your colleagues gather around you at a whiteboard while you regale them with tales about what the P versus NP conjecture actually is. So I hope after spending some quality time with these videos, you feel like you've reached that level or at least are quite a bit closer to that level than you were when we started. Coming up next is, are going to be the videos for the last chapter of the book, chapter 24, which is all about a big and exciting case study on something called the FCC incentive auction, which was a big, complex algorithm involving tens of billions of dollars that reallocated a bunch of wireless spectrum in the United States just a few years ago. It turns out under the hood of the FCC incentive auction, you can find an amazingly wide swath of the algorithmic toolbox that you've learned in this video playlist. So don't miss it. I'll see you there.